Good afternoon, Trita Parsi, and I thank you on behalf of all the Diplomacy Festival team for participating in this year's event. Um, Trita thank Parsi, you so much for having me. Award-winning um, author and uh, the 2010 recipient of the Grover Mayer Award for Ideas Improving World Order, and he's the Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and an expert on U.S.-Iranian relations. Uh, Iranian foreign politics and the geopolitics of the Middle East. And we're pleased to listen to his uh, speech about the um, fundamental overhaul of the US policy in the Middle East today. Thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and always a pleasure to participate uh, in the uh, festival even though it is uh, online this time around. I want to talk about the need for a complete overhaul of the U.S.'s foreign policy towards the region and approach to the region as a whole. I think it is quite clear, particularly to people here in the United States, that the last 25, 30 years of U.S. foreign policy in the region have been a failure. Just take a look at the track record. In 1998, the region suffered from five armed conflicts. Today, there are 22 conflicts that are engulfing the region. This is, of course, not the fault of the United States alone in any way, shape or form, but it is happening under the watch of Pax Americana, when the United States is dominating the region militarily uh, and is the dominant force uh, in the Middle East. It is happening also because of things that the United States has done. The uh, most devastating and destabilizing event of the last 40 years in the region is the invasion of Iraq, which was the fault of the United States itself alone. Um, so the question now has come, can minor arrangements and um, changes to the policy of the United States be sufficient to be able to bring the region out of the current state of conflict that it is in? Or is a need for a much broader effort needed? I would argue that all kinds of efforts of making small changes, however valuable, however important, ultimately have failed because they still take place within a context, within a paradigm that does not support those type of small changes. Let's take the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, uh, as an example. This was an international multilateral effort. It was historic in the sense that uh, a major military conflict that was on the verge of, uh, sorry, a major conflict that was on the verge of becoming military was actually resolved without a single shot being fired through multilateral diplomacy and compromise. However, it was also something that increased the contradiction of America's foreign policy in the region. It meant that the United States did something constructive on the front with Iran, improved relations, dialogue, a real compromise that prevented the Iranians from being able to have an access to a nuclear weapon. But it also meant that the United States' reaction to that was to double down on the relations it had with Saudi Arabia the UAE uh, and Israel. So for instance, before the 2016 elections, officials from the Clinton camp talked about the need to compensate Israel and Saudi Arabia for having struck the nuclear deal with Iran. That is a problem in and of itself because this was a deal that the entire world with a few exception supported. It was also a deal that was squarely in the interest of the United States to pursue. It was no need for the US to compensate anyone on the first ground, but more importantly, if now the United States was gonna give more military support to Saudi Arabia, UAE and Israel, all that would do is that it would further uh, inflame the region, further uh, push the balance of power in such a direction that the Iranians would feel a sense of threat and it would undermine the very effort of trying to get them off of the path towards a nuclear weapon. So even if Trump had not come in and destroyed the deal on his own, there is a significant likelihood that those contradictions actually would have caused the deal to collapse on its 
uh, own because of the fact that we cannot on the one hand pursue that path with one country and then double down on the old path with other countries. So I think in the rare occasions that even a deal like this has been successful, it's not clear, it cannot be durable unless it is taking place, unless it is embedded in a context, in a paradigm uh, that actually helps sustain it. And the critical thing that the United States has been doing for the last 25 years that I think has brought a tremendous amount of problems to the US itself is that he has adopted the position of being the military hegemon of the region. It has now 58,000 troops in the region, more than 19 bases throughout the region. Uh, and much of its policy is no longer dictated by any type of uh, national interest definition of what the region's importance is to the United States, but rather it is dictated by the bilateral relations that it has with specific countries in the region. The relationship of the United States with country A in the region is oftentimes a function of that country's relationship with Israel, Saudi Arabia, or the UAE, rather than an, an approach to the region seeking stability. Rather, the main goal of the policy has been control, not stability. So the destabilizing activities of countries such as Saudi Arabia, who has invaded Yemen, and we've seen the tremendous damage that it has ca caused, has been less of a problem as long as Saudi Arabia is supportive of the US's policy of domination and control. The end result, nevertheless, has been terrible for the region. We see the number of conflicts increasing, and it's been terrible for the United States itself, because a policy of domination is precisely the reason why the United States has ended up in these many endless wars. And we can now hear it clearly from both sides of the political aisle in Washington. Both Republicans and Democrats are talking about the need to end the endless wars because this has now become something that has caused the American population uh, to turn against large swaths of US foreign policy as a whole. The United States has now been in Afghanistan for more than 19 years. It means that there are soldiers, American soldiers in Afghanistan that were not even born on 9-11 that caused the invasion of Afghanistan, but they're still serving in that war. You have parents and children in that same war because it has been going on for such a long time. The idea that not only these wars can be ended, but that these wars would not have begun in the first place seems quite unlikely unless there is a reorientation away from dominance as the guiding star of the policy uh, towards something else. So what would that something else be? Well, the first question we have to ask ourselves then is, what actually is the interest of the United States in the Middle East? Historically, we know that the region has been important to the United States primarily because of the oil that exists in the region. This has increasingly become a lesser uh, strategic rationale for the U.S. involvement in the region. The United States used to import, and the world as a whole used to import, significant amounts of oil from the Persian Gulf. That is no longer the case. And in fact, since 2018, the United States is no longer a net importer of oil. It is actually a net exporter of oil. The key factor has, that has caused all of this is, of course, the shale oil explosion in the United States that has allowed the United States to dramatically increase its own oil production uh, and as a result become far less dependent on not just oil from the Persian Gulf, but from other regions as well. Secondly, it has been critical for the United States to make sure that because of the strategic importance of the region, that no hostile power from the region or from outside of the region becomes the hegemon of the region. This is the evolution of the Carter Doctrine that was changed later on by the Reagan administration that said that if the flow of oil is threatened by any country in the region or outside, the United States would intervene militarily. And we have seen the U.S. do so in uh, 1991, for instance, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. The difference, however, is this. In order to prevent 
a hegemon from taking control over the region, which still today, even with a lesser strategic importance of the Middle East, would nevertheless be important for the United States. The United States itself does not need to be the hegemon, nor does it need to have a large number of military troops in the region. It can achieve that objective of preventing any regional or extra regional hegemon from emerging in the Persian Gulf without having large number of troops by simply having an offshore balancing posture that allows it to be able to intervene. In fact, that is exactly what happened in 1991. The United States did not have a large number of troops in the Persian Gulf in 1990. Saddam Hussein committed a very um, a serious mistake by invading Kuwait and the United States led a UN coalition and within six months, the Iraqis were expelled from Kuwait. Now, knowing that, that that capability exists, that the willingness to intervene militarily, if such a scenario were to emerge, exists, is sufficient to be able to deter uh, any would-be hegemons or any would-be aggressors from t undertaking these things. Having the troops in the region and occupying and being the dominant force actually compels many actors to do the opposite because it provides them with targets and it also makes the United States uh, a key factor in almost every conflict that exists. Again, take Afghanistan as an example. Here you have a scenario in which both the Russians, the Indians, the Iranians and the Pakistanis have numerous colliding interests there, but all of those interests in some way have become secondary to the presence of the US in Afghanistan, in which, for instance, Iran, a country that otherwise was at war with the Taliban um, and has significant animosity towards the Taliban, has been willing to collaborate with the Taliban in order to achieve the objective of uh, undermining the US and, and eventually seeing the US's departure from Afghanistan. So the US, because of its sheer weight and size, has become a factor uh, that outsizes almost all other factors in these different scenarios. There's other things that also have happened with the U.S.'s presence that undermines the U.S.'s own national interest. If we assume that stability truly is the overarching interest of the United States in the region, then we should also be aware that the uh, presence of the U.S. militarily in the region has actually disincentivized certain countries from pursuing diplomatic solutions to conflict because it is simply easier for them to be able to go and lobby the United States and have the United States use its military or its political power to resolve those conflicts for that country, not using diplomacy. So for instance, there has been an ongoing rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran for quite some time. This rivalry has intensified significantly after the invasion of Iraq in 2003. There has been in the last couple of years after the JCPOA, numerous opportunities for the Saudis and the Iranians to sit down and resolve their conflicts diplomatically. The Iranians have offered to go to Saudi Arabia. There's actually been numerous cases in which offers have been made. The Saudis have rejected all of those opportunities. And they did so because they felt that they are in a position of weakness. They were losing in Yemen. They were losing in Syria. They were losing in Lebanon. They were losing in Iraq. And they did not want to go to the negotiating table from that position of weakness. And particularly, that was an option for them to reject this as long as they could get the United States. They could lobby the United States to come in and essentially fight that conflict for them by pursuing maximum pressure and sanctions on Iran. The end result, though, has been that all of these conflicts have intensified. The situation in Yemen has become much, much worse, uh, and opportunities for solving it have been um, abandoned and neglected. All of this suddenly changed last September in 2019. And it was because after several um, incidents in the Persian Gulf in which uh, after the U.S. had imposed an oil embargo essentially on the Iranians, we saw that there were some attacks against oil shipments in the Persian Gulf, most likely conducted by Iran. And later there was a, a very daring attack against the Saudi oil refineries in the east of the country 
that caused half of Saudi's oil production to be uh, eliminated for a couple of weeks. The expectation, again, most likely that was conducted by the Iranians. The expectation of the Saudis was that the United States would act on the Carter Doctrine and step in and defend and attack uh, Iran as a result. The, uh, attacks, uh, defend Saudi Arabia and attack Iran as a result. The Trump administration, however, clearly signaled that they had no interest, despite all of the arms sales that it does to the Saudis, etc., and uh, despite the closeness of the Trump administration with MBS in particular, they had no interest in actually engaging in a direct war with Iran over Saudi Arabia. What happened afterwards was quite interesting. There had been numerous opportunities for diplomacy between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Those had all been rejected. But now suddenly, when the US no longer was willing to go to war with Iran for Saudi Arabia, the Saudis began to signal and engage with limited, careful diplomacy with Iranians through the government of Iraq. The same thing happened for the UAE. And it was an example, unfortunately, that diplomacy ended six months later when the United States um, uh, engaged in a military confrontation with Iran uh, with the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. But it was an example of how as long as countries think that they can actually avoid resolving conflicts diplomatically by going to the U.S. and having the U.S. resolve the conflict for them, they would prefer that than to engage in direct negotiations with their neighbors. When that option did not exist, or at least they thought it didn't exist, then suddenly they discovered the attractiveness and utility of diplomacy. So if the U.S. actually were to reduce its military presence, were to make much clearer lines of when it will and when it will not engage, in military confrontation in the region. There's a significant uh, likelihood that many of the conflicts of the region would not automatically go away on their own, but the various parties would be more inclined to try to resolve those conflicts diplomatically because that ends up becoming the most attractive option compared to the other options that exist, which would be direct conflict between the neighbors. This is something that they want to avoid, it was something that they only favored as long as they thought the U.S. was fighting for them. But with the U.S. out of the picture as a military factor, then suddenly uh, diplomacy tends to become much more attractive. This would suggest that rather than thinking that America's military presence actually has been um, a factor that has contributed to stability in the region, which again, the track record doesn't seem to suggest, mindful of the fact that we've gone from five to 22 conflicts, but actually to say it is the U.S.'s military presence itself that is uh, a driving factor of the increased instability, precisely because of the manner in which it disincentivizes countries from pursuing diplomacy and conflict resolution at the regional level. So the argument here is that uh, not an abandonment of the region, but an offshore balancing position in which the military presence of the U.S. is dramatically decreased and it's signaled quite clearly when the U.S. would and would not intervene and those interventions would only take place if something happens that actually threatens the U.S. or if uh, some sort of an invasion takes place that would allow one country to potentially become uh, a hegemon of the region. From there, we see several other necessary steps. First of all, Unlike the Trump administration that wants to withdraw from many different places, has no plan for how to do it, announces it over Twitter, uh, what we think would be the best way for the United States is to make clear to the countries that now currently host U.S. bases that there will be a five to ten year transition. It will be an orderly transition. It will be a collaborative transition that would allow these countries enough time to readjust their position, readjust their defense postures, um, leave no one hanging. Uh, but nevertheless, it will happen and it will go on even if certain um, stability milestones are not achieved. Because if you tie this to security milestones, then you actually incentivize countries 
that do not want to see the U.S. leave the region. You incentivize them to destabilize the region because the instability will cause the United States to believe that it needs to remain in place. So you need to have a clear schedule, but it has to be collaborative. It has to be worked out with these governments. From there on, the United States needs to engage with all of the region's actors. Part of the reason why the U.S. actually has lost a significant amount of influence in the region is beyond its own military adventurism that has been quite strategically unwise. It has ceased to engage with all uh, uh, major powers in the region. We can see the rise of Russian influence in the region as being directly linked to the fact that the Russians are on talking terms and on pretty good terms with almost every major power in the region. So when uh, uh, diplomacy is taking place, the Russians are present, but that is not necessarily the case uh, for the United States. Let me give you one example that I think is quite telling here. When the Trump administration came in, uh, there was an ongoing negotiation, the Geneva Channel, uh, that involved all countries, including Iran and Saudi Arabia, on how to resolve the Syrian conflict and reach a political solution. The Trump administration came in and they abandoned that channel. And that channel later on morphed into what is today called the Astana process, which is led by Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Syria itself. The EU, the Americans are all absent. So what we're arguing for is actually a significant increase in diplomatic activity, not a decrease, but a significant decrease of America's military interventionism in the region, which we believe have been destabilizing. It would also mean that the United States would actually have to have an approach to the region that is region-wide, meaning instead of having what we have today, which is a hodgepodge of bilateral relations that internally do not make a lot of sense and create a lot of contradictions, including having the United States be allies with um, uh, countries or entities that are in direct conflict with each other, which then drags the U.S. into those conflicts. The United States should have an approach to the region as a whole and the relations of the United States with individual countries should be adjusted to that regional approach, meaning there are neither any positive or negative exceptions. There are no special relations with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, or uh, Israel, for instance. Now, they may have relations with those countries, of course, that are quite different what the relations with the U.S. would be to uh, uh, Iraq or a country like Iran, but meaning that we are not in a scenario any longer in which the security of a specific country uh, is more important than the national interest of the United States in the region as a whole. And unfortunately, that is what has largely been the policy of the U.S. for the last 25 or so years. Moreover, it means that the United States needs to dramatically review its arms sales to the region. The Middle East is the region, particularly the Persian Gulf, that buys more weapons than any other region in the world per capita. The amount of money that is being spent on this is outrageous. The amount of weapons that are going there are outrageous. And we cannot have the expectation that we can stabilize a region by pouring more weapons into it. In fact, many of the countries that are buying these weapons are doing so not because they actually know how to use these weapons or whether they need them, but because buying large number of American weapons is a way for them to ensure that the United States remains committed militarily to the region and does not withdraw its forces. The recent agreement between Israel and Abu Dhabi, the UAE, falls into that category. This was not a peace deal. This had nothing to do with annexation in uh, in Palestine, this had everything to do with if the UAE gets to buy F-35s from the United States, some of the most sophisticated fighter jets that exist. This is a way for the UAE to prevent the United States from leaving the region, because many of these countries in the Persian Gulf buy a large number of American weaponry, not in order to actually be able to use them, but because it's a way as an informal way of making sure that
that there is a security commitment from the United States towards these states. Because if those countries buy those kinds of weapons, the U.S. actually does have an interest in making sure that they win whatever wars they engage in. Um, this has been another destabilizing uh, factor for the region. This amount of weapons is highly counterproductive. What would so much be, uh, what it would be much more effective is to reduce these weapon sales tremendously, particularly to countries that are not sharing U.S. values um, and, and objectives, and instead pursue an regional security architecture for the region. Instead of thinking that the problem of the region is that one specific country is engaged in this or that activity, or that if we can just prevent one country from being able to we uh, buy weapons and then we pour weapons into the other countries, what we are actually lacking in the Middle East is a security architecture. Uh, it needs one, but it needs to be one that has significant regional buy-in. If the United States takes the lead in pursuing it, then likelihood is that it will not be effective. If the United States, together with the, uh, Europe and other countries, potentially other major Asian countries that have a stake in Middle East stability, in fact, have a greater stake in Middle East stability and, uh, and stability in oil prices than the U.S. does, uh, involve them in an effort that could either be modeled on the ASEAN or the OSCE, uh, that would be a far more effective strategy for the Middle East that would bring more stability to the Middle East, less wars, less wars that the U.S. would be involved in than the current approach. These are not necessarily new ideas. We admit that. These models already exist. No one is reinventing the wheel with these proposals. But what is so often happens is that good ideas are waiting for the right time. And the right time has come now because the American public is completely exhausted by the wars in the region. The people of the region are exhausted by these wars. And to just continue on this path because it is beneficial to certain arms industries in the region or to certain dictators in the region that need American protection no longer is sustainable. And I think even more importantly, perhaps, countries that are close to the Middle East, that are the first ones to suffer from uh, refugee flows and the instability that this region ends up uh, in, inadvertently exporting, uh, such as Europe, also need to uh, make a decision as to whether their position is to just continue supporting some variation of the status quo or to pursue an overhaul in this case, actually pursue the same approach to the Middle East that Europe adopted to itself when it wanted to transition away from a balance of power paradigm to a collective security paradigm. Clearly, it's going to be very difficult in the Middle East. Clearly, the conflicts in the region are deep and problematic, but if it could work in Europe, it can work in the Middle East. And if the United States shifts its position away from domination and control and towards stability and become supportive of such an effort, I think that it can not only work, it will be tremendously valuable to the region, to Europe, and to the United States itself. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time and we're not going to have, uh, we don't have time anymore for the questions. We well, thank you a lot uh, for such a contribution. I am sure that you covered all of the questions that were um, asked. And thank, thank you so you much. Again. My pleasure. My apologies that I went over time.